If you're looking to build a business or a startup to a significant valuation, we're going to go through how startup valuations work. We're gonna go through all of the different mechanics that drive the valuation of a startup, particularly technology startups. We're gonna go through the factors that you can focus on to actually build the valuation. And we're also going to go into how investors think, what's going on in their minds as they assess your business, because that's gonna give you the highest chance of success if you know what's going on behind the scenes. If you don't know the mechanics of how this all works, you don't know whether your time and energy is going to turn into a return and a good result, or if it's wasted energy because you're just living into a pipe dream. If you're joining me for the first time, I'm Arya Chittasi, the director of Ingenesis Ventures. And at Ingenesis, we are committed to supporting entrepreneurs to get to the reality of what it takes to be an entrepreneur effectively. Now, a quick thing before we dive in, I'm not an accountant. I don't have an economics degree or anything like that. We are going to go through the bare bones of what you need to know if you're in business from scratch. So you don't need any prior knowledge. Uh, and we're gonna go through the, the ABCs, the foundation, so that you can get a, a handle on how startup valuations work. If you do have that type of expertise, I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Let others know where, what else can they look into if they are trying to master their startup valuations. The thing with this topic is if you go on the media, if you go on the news, there's so much noise and we found that it creates a really distorted image for, for founders, for entrepreneurs and business owners when they're building their startup. So to understand this, let's start here. Imagine that you had this magic black box that just pops out $1,000 every year, right? You don't know what goes on inside it, but it just pushes out $1,000 a year. Now, the question I have for you is how much are you willing to pay for that black box? Now, some of you might say 100 bucks because you think it's still a bit risky and what if it doesn't work? Others might say, oh, maybe $1,000, $2,000, $3,000 because it's gonna pay me back in one, two or three years. Others of you might look at 10, 10 to $20,000 thinking that, hey, this is gonna keep paying off for such a long time that it's worth it to even pay that much money for it. So have a bit of a think of where you would put yourself in that position. Okay, so what does this all have to do with the business? Well, the black box represents a type of ideal business which just keeps generating profits year in and year out. Now, in reality, this is not what actually happens, right? It goes up and down, but just stay with me with this, this theoretical idea. We want this business, after it's all set up, doing well to be paying off in the profits, all of this money to the shareholders or the owners of the business. And, and that's why I'm bringing up this analogy of the black box. If a business is generating, for example, $1 million a year or $100 million a year, whatever it is in profits back to the business owners or the shareholders, then we can start to get an idea of how an investor may think of what they would pay to acquire that business. So now let's look at how some of the market, you know, investors out there and people acquiring business, how do they look at buying businesses. And just like our black box analogy, let's assume that that $1,000 is profit in a business. So not revenue, not like all the money that, for example, the cafe makes, but after you take all the revenue and you account for all of your expenses, you know, the coffee machine, uh, the rent, etc., etc., how much money can I be taking at the end of the year after I account for all of that? That's the profit we're, we're looking at. Now in small businesses like uh, a mum and dad shop, you know, like a, a fish and chip shop or a cafe or something, you're looking at something between one to three times of those profits you would expect to be paid if, if you were selling that business. Why? Because it's quite a manual business. It's not heavily scaled or automated or anything like this. Um, and that, that's roughly what the industry average would be. But I mean, take these averages as a grain of salt because it, it differs so much across the globe and for each different industry. Now, especially when we're working with technology-based companies, you have, for example, software as a service businesses, and these operate quite differently. A lot of people like to value these in terms of their revenue alone. 
right? Why? Because their, their margins are quite large. I mean, they don't have as many costs as, for example, a fish and chip shop or a warehouse or anything like that. And so if you go and look at some, for example, median uh, software as a service sales multiples, yeah, revenue multiples, 11.3x all the way up to something like 7.9x. So that just means that people are people are valuing that company at 11 to 17 times their revenue rather than just their profits each year. But now let's go to larger enterprises and especially tech companies. This is what you can see on the market today. So for example, Apple is about 21 times their earnings compared to their whole enterprise value. So, so that means if you purchased every share of them on the market, you, you also accounted for their debt that they have owed and then their cash, then their earnings each year, uh, people expect that to be paying off for 21 years before that they're making their, their money back. Google is like 14.6 times and Facebook is at, at about 9.5 times. Now, obviously this is just a snapshot in time, but you can see it gives you an idea of how some investors out there may look at uh, the valuation of that company. So there are a lot of different ways to value these businesses, but we don't want to get caught up in you know the dozens of different technical things that we can go into. This is a type of base that you can start relating to how people are looking at the valuation of a company. Now you might be thinking, but hold on, Aria, how does this work for startups? Because a lot of startups have zero dollars revenue or very little. You know, what if I'm only making a hundred thousand dollars of profit per year? How does that even equate to you know making these large-scale startups? And you're completely right. So this is what happens in, in startup land, if, if you will. A startup is growing and they're putting so much investment in day one, trying to build a very high scale you know, business model, right? And they go through this type of chasm because they are not making that revenue and that profits yet. So let me now go through a few methods people use to then judge the valuation of a startup especially before it's making those that level of revenue or profit. Now, the first thing to say is it's actually really difficult. I mean, you know, how on earth would you value uh, that black box if you just had a probability that it was going to go and make you a thousand dollars a year? It's actually really challenging. So the first thing you want to know when it comes to startup valuations is there are no hard and fast rules. There's not like some entity or government uh, body sitting there stamping startups going like, yes, this is valued at $1 million. This is valued at $5 million. It's more about what people are willing to pay for it. There are some sort of uh, strategies and methods people use, uh, investors use in commonality. I'm going to bring up what Equidam says. So this company Equidam has created this type of uh, algorithm and, you know, uses lots of data from the industry to help you with your startup. And they, they aggregate, they pull together lots of different uh, formats and methods and, and give you a bit of a guide for what your startup may be valued at. And, and this helps investors as well as startup founders. So there's things like the scorecard method or checklist method. And this is developed by renowned American business angels. They pretty much created a mini checklist just going like, well, hold on a second. Are you in the idea stage or are you at the development stage? Are you at expansion stage? They literally have different stages and then they're pretty much checking boxes going, well, if you're at this stage, we're willing to consider that you are half a million dollars in valuation, $1 million in valuation, $2 million valuation. So for example, here are some of the actual factors that I used in, in that method. Number one, the quality of the core team. Number two, the quality of the idea. Number three, the product rollout and IP protection. Have they actually protected what they're doing? Strategic relationships, do they have partnerships with different groups that can you know, launch, launch out what they're doing at a large scale? And their operating stage, are they up and running? You know, are they ready to go or are they still building things? So for example, in this method, they take a max valuation of $8 million 
and then they look at different percentages of how far along that road you are. So now the intention right here is we're not going to go into all of that. I do want to point you to that method. You can go and look it up and I can provide some links uh, in the description below if, if you want to further research that. But what I'm trying to point to is these are some of the solutions investors have come up with to do their best to try to benchmark and value uh, your startup in the journey of its growth. Another one is called the discounted cash flow method. And this is quite traditional. A lot of accountants use this. And what they do is they look at year in and year out or even each quarter, they're looking at how much money is this startup going to make and they project that out into the future. Yeah, sometimes five years, sometimes 10 years. And the premise is going, well, you're investing in this company that's going to make this good amount of money in the future. So that's how they then start negotiating the valuation. So, you know, today you might be only making $500,000, but the next year you plan to make, you know, $2 million and then $8 million and then $20 million. And then that is used to negotiate the, the valuation of that business. The last one is the venture capital method. So you're looking at the returns of the investors. What do they expect to get at the end of the day, right? If the startup hits all of its targets and then those are used as the benchmarks to go, okay, this is what we're willing to pay, right? Because most investors want to get something like on the bottom end times five, let alone times 10 to times 100 their money, depending on their strategy of investment. So it's not going to make sense to them if they're paying too much to begin with that they can't make those high scale returns uh, at the other side of the equation. Now you can see the main concern here from an investor's point of view is they're going, well, there's a lot of risk and uncertainty, right? Of what can happen in those next few years. So this is why this is only used as one part or one method to try to identify valuations in companies. Great. So now that we've gone through some of the basics of how valuations work in general, we've gone through how startup valuations work, that they can be quite challenging. And that's why people are even using checklists and different methods to try to gauge what is the value of a startup. Let's now go into a few points about what you can do if you're a startup founder, a startup team, and you want to make sure you're building the valuation of your product, of your service. So number one, it goes without saying, you need to be understanding how and where your revenue and profits are going to be coming. Now, that doesn't mean you necessarily have to do that right next year, but you need to have in your business model going, this is when that profit is going to happen. And that's the, the type of payoff for you and your investors long term. Secondly, you don't only want to look at what you're directly charging, but you also want to look at how you're serving customers and they're staying with you long term. You're building a relationship. So things like how are you holding your competitive advantage so people are staying with your product or service? Investors really want to know, well, what's your secret sauce, right? What, what makes you unique that people are going to stay with your product and love it, be loyal to it in the long term. And this typically connects with how long a single customer will stay with you, right? Will they come in and stay with you for just three months or will it be, you know, three years? So that makes a difference in how an investor will see your product. And finally, being aware of these multiples. So if you are there building your startup, building your business, you want to be aware of what are the different multiples in your industry and what's going to affect how an investor sees it. You see, if a company is more automated, if it is technology based in general, that's going to have a far higher multiple because people know that that's going to be running. It's going to be scalable. It's going to be repeatable. It can keep doing its thing. And that leads it to having a far higher multiple when it comes to its valuation. Therefore, the profits you need to make, it's much smaller compared to what that company is, is worth on the market. So there you have it. I hope that you got something out of how to value your startup. It, it, there's a lot of noise out there and there's so much work that goes on behind the scenes before you just see that this company was valued at this or this company was valued at that. If you got something out of this video, like and subscribe to the channel so we can keep bringing more of this content to you. So if you have any questions about this topic or any challenges you're dealing with in your startup, put them in the comments below. We're continuously on the lookout seeing how we can support you as an entrepreneur to level up and make your company more successful. All right, that's it. Until next time.